Hello and welcome back. Happy Thursday, everyone. Today we will be going over Dev Diary 106, uh, which is the change log for patch 1.6, which is going to be coming um, on March 6th. So pretty, pretty soon here. Uh, there's a bunch of changes. You know, they said it was going to be a relatively small patch, and it's turned out that there's kind of They've added kind of a lot of things, and a lot of things are looking quite a bit better. Uh, specifically, there's a lot of changes to, or some of the changes to AI, I think, are going to improve gameplay quite a bit. Make the AI a lot harder to abuse and this type of thing. Uh, but I did want to kind of scroll down to what I think is the most significant thing, which unfortunately wasn't uh, addressed, which is uh, in the bug fixes section. Now, we're not going to go through the entire bug fixes section, but for those of you who don't know, there's currently a construction bug where the private queue uh, will pay for whatever it normally pays, uh, and it will get an allocation of construction. This allocation is supposed to be proportional to the percentage of the construction of goods it's playing for. Currently, uh, it just gets the maximum, and what this ends up doing is that the state is paying for the private queue while not having control of the queue. And in my estimation, this really significantly affects play patterns. It makes it frustrating to play with the private queue. We've stopped playing with the private queue, and there's no bug fix that addresses this. Uh, unfortunately. So that was uh, a bit of a disappointment. Uh, maybe that'll be kind of on a patch coming out shortly after, so like 1.6.1, something like this. Uh, but as it stands right now, kind of the biggest thing uh, that I was hoping for is not present in the changelog, uh, which is a bit unfortunate, and I just wanted to kind of say that at the front. Uh, we are not going to be going through all of the bug fixes, because there's just like a lot of stuff that, you know, it's, it's fantastic that it's fixed, uh, but it doesn't necessarily uh, move the uh move the needle too too much um there's a few in here that move the needle a little bit you know kind of moving through it uh but uh for the most part we won't go through this you know there's crashes i think that they did stuff to kind of fix some of the shadow realm stuff uh but we're instead going to be focused more on uh you know specifically gameplay and balance changes so Coming back up here, uh, we will get to, uh, into it from the beginning. Hello, Victorians. Today's Dev Diary will be a rundown of all the changes you can expect in the free update, patch 1.6, uh, codename Black Current. As we mentioned in our first teaser for 1.6, this update focuses almost entirely on polish. Uh, bug fixes, performance works, UX, and AI improvements rather than major uh, new features, which, uh, to be fair, this is like entirely how I would want them to be focused on for this patch. Uh, there's like a lot of polish that's needed in some spots. 1.5 introduced a ton of new stuff, so it's definitely understandable that there's kind of, you know, some fires to put out. Our aim here is simply to make the game feel better to play. Nevertheless, there, we're sure that there will be many lines in the sections that are cause for excitement. As we mentioned last week, uh, update 1.6 is to be released uh, sometime next Wednesday, March 6th. Uh, be sure to keep an eye out, etc., etc. And so, new features. Uh, they, rework, they are reworking migration with cultural communities. I talked with some of the devs. It doesn't seem like this is going to unlock a ton of um, uh, migration as it relates specifically to uh, allowing dis discriminated migration to happen and that this was more of an aberration in 1.5.5 and was not intended um, but this should improve performance and so this is going to be hopefully hopefully nice um, a free filterable and sortable uh, uh, full screen census data panel uh, to give you more insight into the population uh, this will be fun to play around with we're definitely going to have a, a bit of a time with that uh, we have voice of the people uh, specific uh, changes uh, implemented additional content for abdicating during revolution. This is interesting, um, and you, you know, it's it's going to be interesting to see exactly how that works. If you can, you know, intentionally spike a revolution in order to abdicate, like this type of thing. Um, I mean, very often you can abdicate for some reasons, so it's uh, in theory going to give you more reasons. This type of stuff added resign from office character interaction. I'm not sure exactly how this is going to work. Currently, you do a lot of exiling people, and maybe the resign from office just allows you to exile without removing someone from, um, you know, the government. If this is the case, it's not a huge difference because normally you just remove from uh, government and then exile but if it is something that is added on top of this this is effectively giving you like another cooldown for that um you know kind of feature so that's kind of nice uh implemented additional character interactions for countries with secret police allowing the assassination of troublesome characters this is kind of neat uh and you know is maybe a reason to go secret police you know kind of more so than normal i I guess we'll have to experiment with that, so we'll be doing some, you know, more secret police things than normal, uh, kind of when 1.6 drops and looking to, to see some things. Okay, onwards to improvements. 
Um, a newly spawned country that, in and this one is spectacular. A newly spawned country that inherits a war goal from a war in progress will now automatically be targeted with a new war for those war goals by the holder of the war. Now that's a lot of words, uh, but let's keep going. Add no additional infamy. That's the key one. A common uh, issue addressed by this change is that revolutions no longer invalidate war goals. So this is one of the most frustrating things that could possibly happen is someone revs uh, when you are targeting them with something and it breaks your war goal. Now it will just start a new war automatically with the uh, country that is revving. And so this is going to be really, really nice uh, because your war goal cannot be bricked in that way. Now I still think there's ways for your war goals to get bricked. Like if you are protectorating someone who is a minor power and they go up to major power, I still think that probably breaks your war goal. But that is like... Uh, brick, getting your war goals bricked is one of the most frustrating things. Uh, this was probably the biggest cause of it, and so now it looks like they have found a solution to that. Uh, it is possible to merge an entirety of Formation A that is uh, itself target. Uh, this one is just like makes it easier to merge. It's not too too big a deal. The art pop category has been replaced with the new leisure category, which is going to be interesting for consumption. Uh, keen to see how this balance works, but letting the very wealthiest among your uh, people self actualize instead. Uh, the need consists mostly of fine arts, so I'm guessing it will be like something like, I, d I don't know exactly what it's going to be, but maybe like let's say 70% of the goods uh, or something like this um, have to come from fine arts, but also an assortment of other goods such as clippers, uh, small arms, wine, and airplanes, etc. Now what is this etc. referring to? If we have airplanes in here, this etc. could mean anything. Tanks? Uh, services now act as a low-weighted uh, fallback if there's if such other goods are exceptionally rare in your market. Okay, but this should currently, um, when you're not like uh, at war, like airplanes, uh, the the prices are like very volatile. There's a few that I think are only when you're mobilized. Do you actually use them? I'm trying to think of airplanes as one of them. Maybe they're not, but if uh, airplanes like you're only using them while you're mobilized, actually it might be airplanes. Uh, then the buildings have to fire off completely um, <laughs> when you're not, uh, you know, currently employing them. Okay. When you're not currently using any military. When a subject starts an independence or increased autonomy diplo play, then up to place in subject's capital instead of overlords. This is a nice little improvement. Overlords taking control of play and no longer get the option to switch sides. Nice. Uh, native uprisings are, uh, now have the native country as the attacker, uh, which means that uh, you can, will no longer stop you from starting a diplo play. I assume it's just starting a diplo play specifically in the build-up period, but this is a nice improvement. Added bu upgrade, uh, a button to upgrade all units in your troop. Fantastic. The game will now warn you uh, if you launch with mods that aren't marked as compatible nice added offense defense and occupation modifiers for unit types offense defense and occupation modifiers for unit types i don't know what this really means added offense defense and occupation modifiers for unit types uh perhaps now there will be more choice available or there will be more reason to, you know, uh, make your army look a particular way. Currently, what the metagame looks like is there's kind of like th two types of armies you really build up. Um, there's a pushing army uh, because you and you want just half infantry, half cannons. Um, and in this pushing army, you make it as big as possible because you can't borrow troops on offense. Um, and then you have defensive armies, which can be as small as you want, uh, which are just all infantry and you just set them all to defense. And then you have landing armies, which are like half infantry, half cannons or some combination of infantry and cav as long as you have 30% cav so you can have the rapid advance on your generals so you can do 20% uh, you know cannons 30% uh, cav and 50% infantry um, but if there's new choices uh, maybe that adds some degree of like gr granularity or like option making in that regard uh, there's some stuff about Garibaldi you know deciding to actually fight in places where it seems more reasonable uh, only fully occupied states now count towards war, war exhaustion uh, added, and this is going to be all big part of the migration changes are going to be really big. Added new mass migration attraction concept, so there's a new mechanic um, relates to mass migration attraction. Updated migration concepts to be more representative of the current game state to be more interconnected. Um, added mobilization and movement speed uh, modifiers for formations and unit modifiers for formations. So maybe your so if this is the case, maybe your unit will move faster if you have cavalry uh, or some amount of cavalry and something like this, which 
I'm not sure if that changes the meta, but again, we're starting to see maybe stuff that is going to be interesting uh, and stuff to explore, which is going to be cool. Add a button to upgrade all upgradable units in a military formation and one for all military uh, formations owned by the player. This is going to save you a lot of clicking when you research a new technology. It is not possible for subjects to switch pl uh, sides into play if uh, the other side has a liberate subject war goal targeting them and they haven't uh, added any additional war goals against them. The AI will only do this if they are rebellious. So this one's interesting. Subjects to switch sides if the other side has a liberate subject war goal targeting them and haven't added any additional war goals against them. So that's interesting. Um, I'm guessing this won't happen too much in practice, but this is an interesting one. It is not possible to attempt to sway rebellious human-controlled subjects by offering them independence or increase autonomy as a war goal. Uh, reverse swaying is also supported, uh, so you can increase their autonomy in exchange for them helping out. Ooh, we get a loud car. Big nice. Uh, the effects of breaking uh, manually and versus auto-breaking pact uh, can now differ. Auto-breaking alliance won't cause a relationship. This is nice, although alliances are kind of... Uh, outside the realm of usefulness currently. Added more URLs for historical characters. Big nice. Canals now provide a bonus to migration attraction. This is going to be really, really nice. Um, in particular, this is going to be nice in the realm of um, often with the the, uh, the Suez Canal uh, specifically, more so than the Panama Canal. It's really hard to employ up. Uh, it's hard to get a lot of pops there. And if there's a huge migration attraction bonus, this will be really nice uh, to being able to employ it up. Uh, something about mandatory baldness, the truth hurts. Um, Pampas, uh, that's not too big a deal. Mongolia looks like it's gotten some flavor stuff. Um, you release a smaller Mongolia, they've uh, changed some, you know, population arable land. So it looks like they've done a little bit of a facelift, Gobir Desert, this type of stuff, uh, in the Mongolia region. Um, a bunch of people now get sericulture, which gives, uh, you know, some additional throughput on silks. Uh, previously only Qing and I think maybe one other person starts with it. Uh, like, I think Wallachia has it or something like this, um, which is a little bit of a, a strangeness. Uh, updated the demographic data of whatever this is to reflect the situation. Um, uh, revised Bulgarian and Corsican uh, name lists. Enacting free trade will now remove the opium ban, which makes sense. Um, improve tooltips and performance, diplomatic lens. Decentralized nations have their, uh, now have their own logic for based on tension and whether it's an ongoing native uprising and won't randomly display a friendly attitude. I'm not sure that this uh, is too big a deal or something to really care about too much, but okay. Uh, typing states now require tum turmoil to be selected. Um, I don't know what selected means. Selected for what? But okay. Um, I'm guessing moving into the typing rebellion, um, which means that, um, okay, it, it requires turmoil, I guess. Uh, Baluchistan now requires nationalism rather than pan-nationalism pan to form. Okay. Uh, moved it, uh, Dutch general, uh, added constants, whatever. Um, and, okay, so a, a lot of a lot of changes here, a lot of improvements, uh, but now we're going on to AI. Uh, the military AI is now, and this is, the, this is the section I was most excited to read through the first time, I think, um, overall, but I, a lot of stuff on the balance stuff is, also seems pretty cool. Um, uh, the military is better at organizing formations and HQs. will create, merge, split, and rearrange its formations to have more balanced sizes. I don't know exactly what this means in terms of having more balanced sizes. Um, I don't know if the AI is going to particularly uh, create mega stacks for pushing, which is what they should do. And if they aren't doing this, um, then they just like wood chipper their army into yours, which is one of the reasons the player can really abuse the AI um, because of the way that... Uh, you can force asymmetries that the AI just doesn't know how to deal with uh, by, for example, having a mega stack if you want to push. And this is one of the reasons why just going defensive versus the AI, you like tend to crush them unless they have doom stacks. Uh, the military AI can now split off temporary formations during wars. And this is really nice because sometimes they just can't cover enough stuff. Specifically, the Ottomans comes to mind. They have like four strategic regions. Uh, and so their ability to defend all four strategic regions from naval landings is basically zero because uh, you can just zip to one region, zip to another, zip to another, and they will only really have only one dedicated force to prevent naval landings, and this kind of helps. Um, 
in order to defend on her advance on fronts it would not otherwise be able to properly cover and so this is covering not having enough fronts uh the temporary formations are merged back into their parent formation after the war is over okay so like the ai is seemingly going to get a lot stronger in wars uh the ai is now less interested in subjugating themselves to foreign powers if they do not have good relations this makes sense the military AI will now create explicit garrison formations in important hqs that it will focus on defending that hq and not travel far from it this is going to make the AI so much harder to uh, really, really abuse, uh, which is a fantastic change. Uh, like, currently, like, the UK will completely leave the home, like, their home, they'll leave it just undefended, the, the home counties. Um, and to be fair, they will generally have Navy to intercept to some extent, uh, but it's just, like, way too uh, hard are way too easy to land. Um, you know, Spain in particular uh, very often just categorically doesn't defend Iberia and you can just land Iberia. And so this is a big and important change. Garrisons have their own separate mobilization logic and will usually be mobilized in the war if they perceive a threat to their HQ. So on top of that, they won't even mobilize until you threaten the HQ, by the sounds of it, which is, uh, which is a great improvement. Um, like, if you're not abusing the AI, these changes aren't like too big a deal, but if you are, they're gonna make the game more challenging, which is gonna be nice. Um, the AI is now more reluctant to give up its subjects in diplomatic plays, particularly if they are a significant value. Um, they were all, yeah, it's, they're continuing to make it harder and harder. Uh, I think the crux of the issue uh, is the AI needs to be able to better recognize if they actually need help. Uh, and if they don't, um, then they should just not be, like, categorically be unwilling to give up stuff, which I think I saw a modifier that was to that effect recently. So um, they are improving this type of thing. The AI now places greater emphasis on defending their capital state. This especially gets backdoor naval invasions. Exactly what we're talking about with Spain and uh, England, where uh, you know the UK should be really, really hard to enforce on, and now maybe they will be. The AI now tends to use defensive orders for their generals. Previously, uh, I mean, I haven't been religiously checking it, but they only use pushing orders, which is really bad uh, because you kind of want to have a mix of each uh, in armies that are trying to push. And then in defensive armies, obviously, you want all defense for the extra 10% defense. And so this makes a, a substantive difference. Um, and this is uh, contingent on them having bad troops. But uh, in theory, what it should do is you should actually have a general with pushing in an army and a general with defending in an army. And it'll select the defender because they'll have better stats and this type of thing and it'll help out. Okay, and they now consider qualifications when determining what to build. Fantastic. So uh, a lot of improvement for the AI to make the AI kind of harder to abuse, which I think is really nice. And now we have a lot of balance changes. Uh, I was very excited about a lot of these balance changes and I think we'll mainly focus on the balance changes. There is a lot of UI stuff, but I think the UI stuff will kind of be able to suss out, you know, when we play through it. And then there's some art stuff, but this is like flamethrower effects, these types of stuff. And so the, really, this is going to be the last section we uh, kind of take a close look at, I believe, because I think the next one is bug fixes after interface. Oh no, there's some performance stuff, so we'll we'll read through that as well. But um, balance changes. Uh, cap the amount of interest you can receive from Navy power projection. Yeah, it was kind of like uh, you would just get ironclads and then you would have max interests and this seems uh, not very linear and interest should probably increase in a linear way. But also it meant that GPs after a certain point would have interest everywhere, which was kind of obnoxious because it removed kind of the interesting gameplay mechanic of trying to uh, target certain strategic regions for plays based on avoiding certain great powers and this was not a play pattern you could do after they had um, you know uh, sufficient technology on the on the Navy front um, I keep looking to the side to like double check that I'm recording because I am recording this before it's been de-embargoed and I'm like mildly paranoid that I'm accidentally streaming it which would be catastrophic but anyways um, so moving forward, uh, technologies can now increase the max number of interests. So this hopefully will make the it feel a little bit more linear. Where eventually in the end game they will have interests everywhere, but it's not just like as soon as you hit ironclads, it's everywhere. Added another canning production method to food industries that allows you to pick between fish or meat as a consumption good. Uh, lowered farm output of grain from uh, you know this amount to uh, this other amount, notably 50% lower on the first level. That's a huge nerf to the first level farm. Huge, 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 huge. Uh, and I believe there's in another section, decrease the amount of uh, food from in subsistence farms from 2.5 to two. So they're, uh, they are just in general uh, increasing the price of grain, uh, both in terms of there's nominally gonna be less of it, but also the equilibrium like 
amount that you are going to, the equilibrium, this is not only just changing the amount of grain in the starting condition, but like also um, the equilibrium price at which, or the, the grain farms will actually try and employ up. If you are at like an equilibrium price, this will be higher. So, um, and grain is the most important for low SOL pops. It's the most important good. So I'm expecting to see actually, uh, uh, not like a huge drop in SOL, but uh, on average, SOL should drop. Um, this should mean less pops, which should slightly improve performance. Um, it also can make going for grain uh, a little bit more impactful as it relates to like improving SOL, maybe something like this. And at the higher levels, it's a little bit more of a wash because it doesn't represent a 50% de decrease. Uh, going from 140 to 120 uh, is a much, much smaller uh, like decrease. It's still a decrease, it's still a pretty big nerf. Um, it's gonna be interesting um, uh, how this affects things, but okay. Remove South America, Africa starting Navy, uh, added cooldown to establishing and disbanding different companies. I think there was already one, but I assume they're increasing it or something like this, or they already added this. This almost seems like, uh, in some spots, it actually seems like um, this is talking about changes that were incorporated in the late uh, later 1.5 patches, uh, because this is already present in the game. So this is, I think... Um, some of these changes are stuff that's already been incorporated. I think we also went through one that's kind of already been incorporated. But okay. Pops will not consider the job sa satisfaction during employ the employment updates. Yeah, this was already included. Uh, reduced penalties on decentralized nations to prevent mass starvation. Well, but you're doing this. So we'll see how that goes. Because um, uh, I think they use sub farms. Maybe they don't. Rebalance the starting situation for countries with military formations in the history of files. Uh, hardwood production and focused hardwood production methods reduced hardwood output uh, to 2 and 20. Um, so these PMs were really overtuned, and there was always a super huge glut of hardwood in the market. Now you're expecting to see less of that, and also this is going to be a pretty significant nerf um, to uh, the, the woodcutters. Now, the woodcutters just on softwood are still extremely strong. We're not seeing a softwood nerf anywhere, so like it's still going to be an insane industry. But this is not an insignificant nerf. I forget exactly what the numbers are. I think the numbers are 2040, so this is like uh, just cut in half. Um, is it 2040? I, I, I guess I actually am not 100% sure. Um, currently, what you do is you do focused hardwood production uh, and just softwood production, and you don't ever do hardwood production. Uh, maybe this changes that. Uh, but it is uh, a pretty nice nerf to uh, what wood deserves to be nerfed. Uh, I think grain, specifically the rice farms are OP, but this isn't addressing the rice farms specifically. I guess the rice farms are much more in line now, especially like late game, they're kind of bad, but okay. Uh, lowered the, they're bad because they are exactly as efficient as something like wheat and you don't have access to the tractor's PM. Uh, whereas before they used to be even more efficient per worker than the wheat, uh, but you would still not have access to tractors. So now it's a trade off in the late game. Still super explosive. Still should cost more construction, but whatever. whatever. Uh, lowered the requirements on companies that affect oil rigs, okay. Public trams and public motor carriages uh, for urban centers pr now produce transportation. I think they already did before, uh, but I think this is like a 1.5, anyways, I think that's already been in there. Uh, decrease the amount of food from subsistence farms. Maybe this has already happened. I would have to double check the PM. Maybe this has already happened. I know they already decreased grain. Yeah. <sighs> I think this might have been a change that already happened. I think a lot of this is referring to changes that have already happened, but happened in the later development of 1.5, but okay. Uh, improve this starting, and also maybe uh, maybe this gets changed, because I am seeing this a day before it gets actually released, and maybe there's some last minute adds to this, but okay. Um, Greener grass campaigns has been balanced to now provide flat migration and uh, in addition with a multiplic multiplic multiplicative bonus. This is really great because uh, greener grass campaigns, this should be impactful no matter who you use it on. And where it was before is like, it would really be not very effective on places where you know you had the intelligentsia bonus plus the rubber bonus or intelligentsia bonus plus an oil or gold bonus or something like this uh, because uh, stacking more and more percent multipliers doesn't really help out that much and so giving a flat modifier would make those percentage multipliers better and uh, you know conversely if a place has a ton of uh, flat attraction 
like being in the new world, uh, greener grass would be way stronger uh, than it perhaps maybe should be. And so uh, having greener grass uh, overall have more of a flat power level, I think is a, a good thing in general because it's doing the thing you want it to do uh, more just like more consistently uh, and not overdoing it or underdoing it. Um, we have improved starting situation for a bunch of countries. Uh, agitators now may only participate in election once every six months. I'm not sure exactly what that means even. Um, we get uh, more historic. Okay, downsizing a building that isn't fully staffed now only generates a proportional number of radicals to its staffing. Uh, uh, now only generates a proportional number of radicals to its staffing and no radicals if the level wasn't staffed at all. Um, I didn't realize that this wasn't the way it worked, but okay. Uh, researching paved roads no longer adds any infrastructure from POPs, uh, and now instead it's tied to automobile consumption. I think the automobile XPM is still really trash, and so probably still going to avoid using automobiles writ large. Um, but maybe this is something we take a closer look at. I've been meaning to take a closer look at it anyways. I'm fully willing to admit this might be something I'm wrong. Uh, but just like when you look at the PM, when you like, uh, when you do like the feel test, like, uh, it actually feels great to turn on the automobiles. But when you actually like look at the PM in the spreadsheet, it doesn't look very good at all. Um, converting to state atheism now gives you more, uh, number of guys. I think that's already been in. Add more combat, uh, penalties to panic retreat. Um, uh, more morale damage to... Panic Retreat, uh, added straits between Sumatra and Java, Java and Bali, Z Zealand and Jutland, and New Zealand. Okay. They also removed some straits somewhere else here, and we'll see, get to those, I guess. Uh, citrate orchard production methods now don't consume all wheat. Hmm. Okay. Uh, barbed wire is now unlocked by Fieldworks. This perhaps makes some sense. We'll make Fieldworks a little bit better. Uh, remove serfdom and swapped uh, slave trade uh, for legacy trade uh, slavery in Grau Para. For those of you who are Grau Para enjoyers, shout out to you. A few of the brave, the Grau Para, para enjoyers. Uh, companies now require, that require 10 levels now only require 3 levels. Man, this is godsend for smaller countries. This is going to make it way, way easier to turn on the good companies. So this is really nice. Uh, and it being 10 levels never made a ton of sense to me. It seemed like a weird restriction. So, uh, change the locking technologies for some cavalry units. I think they already did this, but I guess this might change it some more. Uh, where lancers were not available at the very beginning and they're like unlocked last and this type of thing. Uh, consumer goods tutorial now looks at local price instead of market prices. Okay. Travel time for formations uh, through different terrains. Difficult, different terrains has been lower. Interesting. Stormtroopers tech now gives offense uh, bonus to trench, squad, and mechanized infantry. Again, I think that this is live already, um, but I'm not 100%. I know it gives offense. I don't know if it's specifically on these ones. I think it is, but okay. Uh, Brazilian monarchy now m benefits from great power status. This should make the, the, what is it, the journal entry a little bit easier. China now starts with closed borders. Pretty sure this is in-game already. Uh, and so we're seeing a lot of stuff that's already in-game, which is kind of a little bit of a disappointment regarding the organization of um, the, uh, the, the, the balance log. But I guess they didn't really have a change log. I guess this is the change log since the last change log, uh, which includes a bunch of 1.5, later 1.5 patches or something like this, maybe? I'm not sure. Uh, dramatically, uh, drastically increased naval power projection requirement for Brazilian trade, tra slave trade event. Job satisfaction from being able to afford expenses now scales with income, uh, in, with the income to expenses ratio instead of being a flat value. Okay. I'm not sure exactly what this will do or if it's in game already, um, but okay. What will it? Nah, okay. We'll, we'll, we'll keep going. Uh, when a country is cut down to size and now receives a decaying prestige penalty, is isn't unable to start any aggressive diplomatic plays for five years. Bravo. I think this is a fantastic change. Um, currently, uh, if you... I, I don't do this a lot. Um, but, like, people, like... Uh, keep, so I think some people are under the impression that I, I play as meta as possible, but there's a lot of things I don't do. I don't very aggressively reset infamy, and so uh, I think it's great that they increased another penalty to cut down to size, because what the strongest strategy for a lot of starts has been um, is uh, if you don't start out with any subjects, it can be very, very strong to transfer EIC, um, you know, in your first war, and then let someone cut you down to size, and then back down before enforcing on the transfer EIC. Uh, and this way, uh, you get to, like, uh, you get to reset your infamy, because your infamy goes to zero when you get cut down to size. So, um, 
I think in general, um, I'm super okay with them punishing players for using the uh, cut down to size to reset their infamy effectively by saying no more wars for five years. Okay. Uh, pop need rebalancing between categories, especially in the wealth 20 range. I think they already did this. Uh, Han Yang Company now gives 20% attack bonus for shrapnel artillery. I'm not sure if that's in already, but okay. Removed impassable terrain from islands and other areas where it's blocking combat for no reason. Fantastic. Reduced rubber input for uh, elastics to 10. So this is a wholesale kind of change with uh, how rubber is going to be used. Lowered rubber input and tools output for machine tool steel tools. Machine steel tools were super OP. We haven't seen... Or they weren't, well, they were really, really OP when I accidentally had the input wrong on the spreadsheet, but they were still probably the best industry in the game overall. Um, the only one that was like better would maybe be small arms because, uh, especially because it consumed hardwood, but now hardwood's been nerfed, and so that's less of an issue. And, uh, you know, machine steel tools is being brought more in line um, and won't be as OP. But I think what the idea was is I think the way the meta was evolving is you would just never use uh, elastics because one, the PM wasn't that efficient, uh, you know, relative to the other um, clothing industry uh, PM, but also secondarily, the rubber was so good on the steel tools that it uh, just made it feel like you just would only use the rubber for tools, you wouldn't use it for elastics, but now, Less gets consumed in the machine steel tools, which kind of gives it up, and less will be consumed also in elastics. So now I'm imagining you turn on elastics, and this is a bit of a change. Reduced engine input of reinforced wooden ships. This is pretty good because oftentimes this would not be very profitable, but you would still turn it on to change the capitalist ownership. Uh, and now this is good that they kind of do this. Uh, increased steamers output in steamships uh, production method. I think that that was already a decent PM, but okay. Um, that seems fine. Lower the modifier for Metropolitan Railway. It would give plus 100% throughput on railways, which would actually be crippling in some circumstances where you actually didn't want the throughput. And so, uh, because it would increase the input costs for, uh, you know, the same amount of infrastructure. So this is probably a good thing overall, maybe. Certainly makes the event less disruptive to your game. Lower the interception chance of admirals and convoy mission, escort missions. Um, I, I hate this. Um, it's already feels like it's really hard to, like, actually, uh, make interceptions happen, but, okay. Added submarine offense modifier, uh, to experienced, uh, and expert convoy raider. Okay, balanced, uh, many companies, prosperity modifiers, to not be as powerful and made them more diverse. Again, this is something that has already happened in 1.5, so I don't know if they've done this even more. If they have, this is spectacular. I guess, well, it remains to be seen. Hopefully they've nerfed Ericsson, but we don't see anything in there, because that gives you 10 levels of private education, which is uh, a bit silly. We, had, we added farms some places. Explosive factories now consume fertilizer and paper instead of coal and iron. I think they are already consuming fertilizer and paper. I can't remember if they consume coal and iron, but I think they consume fertilizer and paper. So, um, okay. Reduce the, they really, really, but if this is, yeah, I think this is already in. Reduce the amount of workers uh, from, uh, this by the way makes explosives way, way better at sulfur fact, uh, places that have sulfur relative to places that have coal and iron as well. Uh, just like in terms of mappy considerations. Reduce the amount of workers removed from automation production method in livestock ranches. Livestock ranch has already sucked, so I don't know why they're nerfing it, but okay, it's been nerfed. Um, well, I mean, like, to some degree, maybe this is a better simulation of things, but, like, you really don't want to build livestock. Uh, gone through, well, I guess, I guess if you're nerfing grain as well, then maybe it, like, makes sense? I'm not sure. Um, gone through and balanced some companies to make prosperity bonuses more valuable. Reduce the amount of infrastructure from street life production by 50%. This is probably fine. The PM is really good, but like electricity is like, electricity is super painful to turn on. Um, the P the first PM for electricity is really, really, really bad. And the big reason to want to turn it on is the street lights PM. And so the fact that they nerfed the street lights PM, the street lights PM itself is insane. So uh, maybe don't dislike this aspect of it but the fact is, is like that was the payoff for going electricity with just the first pm and now it feels pretty bad to be honest and it already felt bad so yeah. I, i'm also not a fan of the local goods i think uh, I, i've been meaning to um put feedback that i think there should be a game setting you know how you could turn off the private queue i think you should be able to turn off local goods um because they make uh, the game a lot more tedious i think um but okay
uh, but I, I think they increase realism. So, like, this is not... I don't have a criticism on that front. I just think the trade-off's not worth it. Uh... Increase the attraction of upper middle strata pops uh, in military and armed forces. Okay. Uh, slightly reduce the military penalties uh, from the lost Opium Wars modifier. This is apparently a really, really oof modifier. But I think if you're playing the player, or if you're the player, you... Okay. Uh, I know a lot of players struggle with this, because a lot of them comment about struggling with this. But it's definitely possible to very consistently win the Opium Wars, so... Reduce radical gain from losing the opium, which isn't to say that every player should be able to do it, but it's never like, uh, it's not a variance thing. Um, it's not a variance issue, uh, losing the opium war, um, as far as I can tell. Um, so, okay. Uh, the Taiping Heavenly Kingdom will now be much more of a credible threat. This is kind of already in. I don't know if this is more and more of a credible threat. It definitely is very consistent. China no longer starts with hot as primary culture. That's interesting. Um, I don't think that's currently in place. I'm guessing it's just Manchu. Uh, I'm guessing there's some way to incorporate Han as a primary culture, but that's fascinating. Um, but, uh, I think they start out with, like, uh, uh, racial segregation or cultural exclusion anyways. But if they don't, they'll have a ton of discriminated pops, uh, which would be interesting. Uh, but I think that they do start out with one of those. Um, if they don't, though, oof. That's gonna be that's gonna make China like way struggle bussy. Added die potentials to South Carolina, Georgia, and Florida. This is already in the game, one hundred percent. Was having a discussion about this with someone earlier today, where they said you had to get dies from somewhere else. Then I was like, no, you can build it. Um, mass migration now consistently checks for turmoil or SOL, uh, specifically in the relative states. Uh, this is part of the migration uh, kind of change. This is the removed straits. Uh, publicly traded is now available at all levels of, levels of the motor industry. Removed artillery foundry in Mexico. Okay, pollution is now on meat production. Okay, socialist demagogue will now spawn less often. Sure, puppeting Bolivia now makes the Peru Boliv Bolivia journal entry fail. And so I'm not sure if this makes it so... Okay, so first of all, this says puppeting, not dominating, not protectorating. So I don't know how that changes things, right? I don't know if this language is correct, but th what this seems to imply is that you can't just subjugate Bolivia and then get it all. But I think that going for uh, North Peru and releasing the other two subjects is maybe a little bit more efficient anyways, so... Um, okay. Uh, increased requirements for Confederation of the Rhine. Characters that basically agree with government can no longer be exiled. That is an interesting change, and that will actually make it way harder. So, currently, like, you get multiculturalism through doing, um, uh, through exiling, uh, individuals to force uh, someone who's a general or an admiral into government, and this is a very common play pattern. This play pattern, or this might significantly disrupt this play pattern from in regards to multiculturalism, so it's interesting. It certainly makes sense, though, that the government can't exile someone that's fully on board with the government. Um, but then there's, like, the step of, about now being able to step down. New features uh, where you can abdicate or uh, resign from office. So um, I guess we'll see uh, how all this works. And if maybe you have to use your resign from office cooldown instead uh, for the people who basically agree with government something like this this will be interesting uh increase the chance of wealthy uh lower strata pops joining the petite bourgeoisie okay i think that this is already in game strike event no longer reduces productivity of the entire country that's super nice that event just like hurt really hard but like you would just try and avoid it um shopkeepers in resource buildings now may join the petite bourgeoisie hmm okay i didn't okay uh Increase the chance of wealthy lower strata. Yeah, I think that these petite bourgeoisie changes were already part in game. Um, so, elected bureaucrats now makes PB more inclined to join, or bureaucrats more inclined to uh, join the petite bourgeoisie rather than boosting. This again, this is already in. Um, hereditary bureaucrats does the same with aristocrats, and then this uh, does it with uh, intelligentsia. Uh, subsistence buildings uh, under collectivized agriculture now employ uh, fewer clergymen. I'm not sure if this was in already or not. The monarchy law now increases political strength of aristocrats rather than providing flat bonus. Yes. The Council of Republics more inclined to generate uh, uh, due laws um, in a particular way. Agitators no longer interfere with the enactment of laws they have no stance for. Interesting. Definitely sounds like a good change. Um, less agitatory. 
A uh, few states, a uh, few state uh, states penalty to mass migration chance now works through a multiplicative modifier rather than division. Few states penalty to mass migration modifier now works through a multiplicative modifier rather than division. I'd have to see how exactly this gets unpacked in terms of the math. Uh, apparently, this modifier has always been. In, I don't remember what the number is or if I'm. I don't think it was in a context where I'm not allowed to talk about it. I guess I'll just not talk about it. Um, but no, no, no. It was uh, it was talking with one of the developers on the Discord where uh, apparently there's a certain number of states that if you have less than this number of states, it decreases your ability to get mass migration. And this has always been in the game. It was something I was unaware of, but it's a reason to gain more states as someone like Belgium because this will increase your mass migration rate. Which is interesting. Gave Montenegro a Nez a grain import trade bonus. Trade route. Okay. Rebalance the value of population factors before migration. Um, Campania Sudamericana de Vaporis. Now targets shipyards instead of ports so that it can be prosperous. Makes sense. Already, I think, an issue thing that's been in the game, though. Uh, because I think they removed everything that was shipyard related. Okay. Exiling interest leaders that uh, now angers their interest groups. This is uh, kind of this is already in game. Patronized realism no longer requires so many arts academies. Reduce bureaucracy penalty for Greece uh, restoring the Olympics. Okay, interesting. I didn't realize you could do this as Greece. The truth hurts. Okay, uh, vineyards are now uh, in agriculture building group instead of the plantation building group. That is interesting. But okay, sure. Uh, there's some art stuff, locomotives types, now spawned on, based on culture, political connections, and market connections. There's, like, uh, something that it adds visual, yeah, this is the one, adds visuals to city building, which represent the standard living in the area. This both seems super cool, but also, like, does this negatively affect performance? Probably not too bad, so maybe it's not a, not a thing. Uh, there's a ton of inf uh, interface changes that are going to be really cool, but I think that reading through this is, like, not going to be as cool as just, you know seeing it when it's in game so we're not going to read through this specifically and also this dev diary is really long so um we're gonna we're gonna get just skip over it uh performance reworked how pops migrate to reduce the overall not all number of pops of world in order to improve late game performance they said they reduced it by like 20 percent, which is fantastic shortened load times when starting a new game it made ai spending uh updates more per, uh for performance uh okay Reduce the size of several particle textures to improve performance. Big nice. Resolved, uh, resolved performance issue uh, with the revolution update toggling all mesh object. I don't even know what all this means, but okay. Reduce performance impact of Diplo plays by having the AI calculate uh, if it wants to declare neutrality once per diplomatic play instead of checking each tick. I had no idea that it was checking each tick, but this seems really good. It also seems like something you can cheese. <sighs> If you know when they're going to declare neutrality, uh, then you don't add anything that uses infamy until after that point. Uh, and hopefully that's not at the very last second, because if you, it is at the very last second, that'll be, like, pretty annoying. Because often you, like, kind of want to let people declare neutrality out if you're going to add something that's big infamy to try and avoid people signing. I don't know. But um, it's almost certainly good that they're, they're changing it in this way. So we're on board. Optimize battle code to prevent unnecessary modifier recalculations, parallel checks for condition updates, uh, or paralyzed checks. This seems good. Improve performance while uh, when iterating props by reducing the object's memory footprint, leading to better cache utilization. Those are a lot of words, some of which I understand. Uh, improve performance of unit morale calculations. Uh, the modding section. There is a modding section. I don't do modding, so all of this will not really... Um, doesn't doesn't move the the needle on me and then and then we have the bug fixes uh which you know there's a lot of bug fixes um it seems really great that there are bug fixes growing colonies are no longer removed temporarily during native uprising um you know there's like a lot of stuff here that seems good um trade states diplomatic action request that uses obligations are no longer delivered with a pink smiley face this is a strict nerf to enjoyment but okay um uh but not in here was the private queue thing um which to me um i mean i i guess maybe i should have been tried to be more vocal uh 
with that. I, I well, it's not. Uh, I, I that this is this is kind of uh, what I've gleaned from people who are regular players or like play a lot, is that this is actually the most annoying bug, um, and this is the most annoying bug to me because a lot of the other bugs you can play around it, like you can play around stuff getting shadow realmed and like this type of stuff, um, but the construction bug in particular is very very frustrating. Um, and so, I mean, I've just stopped playing with the private queue as a result of it. I'm guessing I will continue not playing with the private queue. I was really hoping that that would be something that gets fixed in here, and it's not. Um, and so that's a bit of a disappointment. Um, probably going to... Uh, I'm recording this on Wednesday. I know I said happy Thursday. I'm sorry if you feel that I've lied to you. But um, probably on Thursday, I will try and leave feedback that, uh, to the best of my ability, that... Um, this bug is really, really obnoxious, and um, if not in 1.6, it probably should be fixed in 1.6.1, uh, because it, it basically makes, um, not that Lazy Fair has to be, like, uh, super good, but, like, I, uh, I want them to either make the private queue taking over your queue be, like, a feature and intended, or to fix the bug. Uh, and not be in this sort of limbo where I'm trying to figure out how to play the game properly and I'm playing around a bug and it's dramatically affecting how I'm going to play the game by like passing interventionism and not going laissez-faire until I have an enormous economy or something like this. Um, because only controlling 25% of the queue often leaves you in a, like, a situation where you don't get to influence um, you know, kind of the ratios in your market very much because almost all of your construction is going to railroads and uh, government buildings and like this type of stuff. So, and maybe you'd be a little bit aggressive, less aggressive with building the railroads and hope the auto queue p picks it up, but still. Um, you just like auto expand the wood and then build government buildings and that's it um, uh, in terms of playing around the bug. Uh, in truth, this update turned out a little bit bigger than we originally intended. There's a lot of stuff in here, but to be fair, a lot of this stuff's already in the game. So, but okay, they fixed a ton of bugs as well. Which, like, this is, this is, I just want to emphasize, because, like, uh, obviously I'm, I'm, I'm expressing displeasure at, like, not fixing the bug I really care about. This is fixing a ton of bugs. This is a lot. This is some scrolling. This is a lot of bug fixes. Uh, and so I think that, uh, you know, this is uh, a very nice that they've gotten all this done. So um, this is, uh, is going to be cool. Uh, introduced a lot of uh, new and reworked features. Or, sorry, the Anniversary Edition Update 1.5. Introduced a lot of new and reworked features. This is true. And we felt the game needed some additional attention to stabilize the gameplay experience. And introduce even more new systems with upcoming spheres of influence expansion. So this is going to be the, like, the stabilizing patch. I imagine, um, currently, currently there's no, there's no feedback, um, right, because this is locked, uh, I have access to it, but you guys don't, nah, 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 something like this, uh, but I imagine that one of the first comments in here is probably going to be relating to the construction queue, because that's what it was like with the last, um, dev diary, but, uh, in any case, still very excited for 1.6, uh, this will be big nice, we will just be playing, uh, we will probably have a stream pretty long. Um, super excited about the AI changes. The AI being a lot more competent is really going to be a big one. I mean, I still think they need to make the AI just build more construction as well, because this is probably the biggest weakness of the AI. But the fact that it's going to be really, uh, hopefully a lot harder to abuse the AI. And if, the, if, it, if this organizing its formations in HQ and create split merge, if this allows it to just make doom stacks very intentionally, uh, and then, uh, you know, split when it needs to. This is going to be really make it a lot stronger at pushing you and this type of stuff. And so this is going to be um, super, super cool. A lot of improvements, a lot of features. Anyways, I hope you guys enjoyed. If you did, please feel free to cut, like, comment, subscribe. I know this one's been really long. Uh, and other than that, have a good day.